morning. Um, we are ready to begin. I will count down from five and then we'll start. Five, four, three, two, one. The Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions will come to order. Welcome again, everyone. I note that a quorum is present. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on improving retirement security and access to mental health benefits. This is an entirely remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. I would also ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while in the proceeding and members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera. And they shall be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this is if they are experiencing technical difficulty and inform committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulty during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure that you are muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulty, a Congressman 11 or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is an entirely remote hearing and as such, the committee's hearing room is officially closed. Members who choose to sit with their individual devices in the hearing room must wear headphones to avoid feedback, echoes and distortion resulting from more than one person on the software platform sitting in the same room. While the recent guidance from the Office of the Attending Physician has made mask wearing optional at this time, please know that we have in our midst at both the member and staff levels, the committee strongly recommends that masks continue to be worn out of concern for the safety of unvaccinated and immunocompromised committee members and staff. In order to ensure that the committee's five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time using the committee's digital timer which will appear in its own thumbnail picture. Members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we are meeting to discuss how Congress can improve workers' retirement and access to mental health benefits. As our economy continues to recover and our constituents struggle with higher costs caused by the pandemic, now more than ever, we need to help workers and retirees achieve financial stability, including a secure retirement and high quality health care, including mental health and behavioral health. According to the New York Times, roughly 55 million Americans are 65 and older. And those at the peak of the baby boom are reaching 65 this year. Many are working later in their lives, relying on their next paycheck to make ends meet. With the Federal Reserve indicating many Americans would struggle to come up with money to finance an unexpected $400 expense each month, such as a car repair, too few are earning enough to save for a dignified retirement. Similarly, healthcare, particularly mental and behavioral healthcare, is too often unaffordable for workers and their families. Even before the pandemic, less than half of individuals with mental illness and only 11% of individuals with a substance abuse disorder received needed behavioral health services or treatment. The pandemic has underscored the urgency of this crisis. In the past two years, Congress and this committee has remained has have remained committed to improving retirement security and strengthening health coverage for workers and families. Last March, Congressional Democrats and the administration addressed the urgent multi-employer pension crisis and fully protected the pensions of more than 1 million Americans. Our solution was broadly supported by key stakeholders, including hundreds of employers in the United States Chamber of Commerce. Had we not acted, plans would have failed workers and retirees would have lost nearly everything they worked so hard to save 
and employers would have been forced to close or cut jobs. In November, the committee advanced the Retirement Improvement Savings Enhancement RISE Act. This bipartisan legislation would make meaningful improvements to improving the retirement security of American workers. And I wanna thank all my colleagues, the ranking members of the committee and the subcommittee. The committee has played a leading role in strengthening health benefits, including through efforts to improve enforcement of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. However, we know that there is more work to be done, much more work to be done, to build a stronger, more inclusive retirement system and improve access to mental and behavioral health care. Today, I look forward to discussing several common sense solutions to help us do just that. First, the hearing will explore draft legislation that Representative Lucy McBath intends to file. This draft bill makes a number of improvements in the nation's retirement system and includes important legislation that has been or will be filed by our committee colleagues. Specific, specifically, the discussion draft helps 401k participants better understand the fees they pay on investments. This is based on legislation that Representative Susan Wilde plans to introduce soon. In, it increases lifetime income options in workers' 401k plans. This is based on bipartisan legislation Representative Don Norcross and Tim Wahlberg, our colleagues recently introduced. I wanna thank them for their leadership on this, along with Representative Wild and McBeth. Give work, this also gives workers additional opportunities to be part of their employer's retirement plan. This is based on legislation that Representative Kathy Manning recently introduced. It boosts employee ownership programs through Department of Labor. This is based on legislation that Representative Joe Courtney and Mark McCann introduced. And it encourages emergency savings. This is based on bipartisan legislation introduced by Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman and Congressman Frenchfield. The discussion draft also includes provisions to increase spousal protections in 401k plans that were included in legislation offered by our colleague, Representative Lauren Underwood. I look forward to today's testimony on how this package as a whole can bolster Americans' retirement security. Second, the Biden and Harris administration has taken steps to reverse the prior administration's rules that made it harder for retirement plans to consider climate change and other environmental social governance or ESG factors when selecting investments. Workers are interested in investing in a way that reflects their values without sacrificing returns, something Representative Andy Levin has been working on and we look forward to the final rule. Third, the administration recently released a report examining implementation of mental health parity by health plans. The report, the report found widespread failure by health plans to comply with important requirements of the law and made several recommendations that would improve enforcement and strengthen coverage of behavioral health, both for the benefit of workers, their employers and retirees. And finally, we will learn about ways to protect workers and their families from barriers they face in enforcing their rights under retirement health plans, including mandatory arbitration agreements, discretionary clauses, and other technical issues. Through these common sense solutions, I am hopeful, I'm confident we can take another step forward to help Americans retire with security and access to all the health care they need and deserve and have paid for. I welcome my Republican colleagues' support and hope we can work together to further secure Americans' financial futures. Now it's my pleasure to recognize the distinguished ranking member for the purpose of making his opening statement, Representative Allen. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm unmuted. Can uh, you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, well, I'm, I'm in the committee uh, hearing room and I'll be just delighted to have you next to me uh, sooner than later. So I would hope we would consider that as we uh, open up uh, our, uh, our house to the people. Uh, thank you for holding uh, this hearing today. Uh, our, our retirement system is healthier than it's been in decades. Employee-based retirement savings are thriving more Americans see the value of saving for the future. 
Committee Republicans are working to make the future of American retirees more secure, strengthening employer-sponsored retirement plans, particularly defined contribution plans, is the best way to encourage workers to put money toward retire retirement savings voluntarily. The committee is addressing much needed reforms for the defined contribution retirement system through bipartisan legislation. The RISE Act, HR 5891, and the Securing a Strong Retirement Act of 2021, HR 2954, will expand American workers' access to secure retirement. The committee should focus on enacting these bipartisan bills. Specifically, the RISE Act expands multi-employer plans, which will make it easier for nonprofit organizations, educational institutions, and small businesses to provide retirement benefits to their employees. The RISE Act also expands retirement savings for part-time and traditional workers, helping more Americans get ready for retirement. And the RISE Act also allows employers to offer small financial incentives to, empl incentives to employees for participating in retirement plans. The earlier American workers prepare for retirement, uh, the better. Empowering American workers to take ownership of their retirement savings is important for their long-term financial health and that of their families. It also contributes significantly to the future economic health of our nation. We must protect taxpayers from irresponsible bailout schemes. President Biden's bailout of multi-employer pension plans in the so-called American Rescue Plan was reckless and irresponsible, sending $97 billion to underfunded pension plans without addressing the root cause is like scooping water out of a boat while it still has a hole in it and sinking. Uh, when I first, uh, my, one of my first hearings on this committee was, uh, and this was eight years ago, dealing with multi-employer pension plans, and we've yet to do anything about it. The multi-employer pension system is in desperate need of systematic reform to protect workers and retirees from further mismanagement and to stop creating incentives for underfunding the plans, plus costing taxpayers millions of dollars. Unless changes are made, these pension plans will backslide into old destructive patterns. We must demand accountability, transparency, and assurances that taxpayers will never again be asked to bear the burden of mismanaged pension plans. Furthermore, we must be vigilant against the Biden administration's aggressive and punitive regulatory agenda. The administration has demonstrated that it cares more about its radical progressive agenda than the financial well-being of, of uh, retirees. This was evidenced by the Department of Labor's proposed rule that will pressure retirement plan fiduciaries to prioritize environmental, social, and governance factors when investing retirement plan assets. This is a reversal of protections the Trump administration put in place for retirement savers. So now the president of the United States is going to tell people where to invest their money. This is ridiculous. That is why Republican leader Fox and I sent a letter to Secretary Walsh in December requesting that the DOL rescind this pr proposed rule. Retirement plan fiduciaries are caretakers of retirement accounts, not social justice warriors. Putting the Biden administration's radical green and social agendas above the financial in interest of retirees is unacceptable. With government-run retirement plans faltering, it is more important than ever to strengthen employer-based retirement savings. Our bi bipartisan legislation will empower both employers and workers to cooperate for a better and more secure future. Lastly, I'd like to add a note about this hearing. Uh, cramming sweeping and diverse topics into one hearing fails to give these important issues a really thorough bipartisan discussion. I hope that this committee can aim to do better in the future. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk. 
Uh, you should do this electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on March 15th. It's now my pleasure to thank and introduce our witnesses today. Um, thank you for being part of the hearing. I'll start with Ms. Amy Matsui. That name sounds familiar to me. Is the Director of Income Security and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Health Center. Ms. Karen Handorf is Senior Counsel at the law firm Berger Montag. Mr. Andrew Biggs is a Senior Fellow and Resident Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And Mr. Aaron Shapiro is Head of Retirement Studies at the Public Policy at Morningstar, Inc. We very much appreciate the witnesses for participating today and look forward to your test testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that they have, that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the rehearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. During your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and light will blink when your time is up. Please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over, and then remute your microphone. If any of you experience technical difficulty during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted, and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided to you in advance. We will let all the witnesses make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. The witnesses are aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee, and therefore we will proceed with their testimony. I will first recognize Ms. Matsui. Uh, your mother-in-law has asked me to be nice to you, and I will. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair DeSaulnier, Ranking Member Allen, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Fox, and members of the committee and subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify about improving women's retirement security. My name is Amy Matsui. I'm the Director of Income Security and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. In order to ensure a dignified retirement, women need retirement income from employer-sponsored pensions and retirement savings plans to supplement Social Security's modest benefits. But because women face workplace inequities and shoulder the burden of family caregiving, they experience disparities in retirement income and retirement savings. Women, especially women of color and women in low-wage jobs, may have less access to retirement savings plans at work. And even when women participate in retirement savings plans, they may be less able to save from their smaller paychecks. The gender wage gap alone costs women $400,000 over a 40-year career, with the lifetime loss of earnings for Black women and Latinas approximating $1 million. And COVID will likely have negative long-term effects on women's lifetime incomes, wealth, and overall economic security. According to an AARP survey last year, more than one in five women reported that they prematurely dipped into their retirement savings or stopped contributing altogether during the pandemic. For all of these reasons, married women rely on their spouse's retirement income and savings more than men do. Unfortunately, loopholes in spousal protections under ERISA undermine women's retirement security. The Retirement Equity Act of 1984 established spousal protections for traditional defined benefit pension plans by requiring the default form of benefit for married participants to be a joint and survivor annuity. In order for a married participant to receive pension benefits in a different form, like a single life annuity or a lump sum, the participant's spouse must agree to waive his or her spousal rights in writing before a notary public or plan administrator. This prevents the participant's spouse from making unilateral decisions that impact their spouse's retirement. However, the same protections do not apply to defined contribution plans like 401ks, which are the predominant form of employer-sponsored retirement benefits. A married participant in a DC plan must obtain spousal consent if they want to designate a beneficiary other than their spouse to receive the account balance in case the participant dies while working. But unless a married worker elects to receive their DC account balance in the form of a life annuity, ERISA does not require DC plans to provide a joint and survivor spousal annuity as the default form of benefit. In other words, no spousal consent is required 
if the participant retires or changes jobs and decides to withdraw the account balance as a lump sum or roll it over into an IRA. At that point, there's nothing to stop the participant spouse from taking actions that could undermine the other spouse's retirement security. For example, the participant spouse could withdraw his retirement savings and make a risky investment, an extravagant purchase, or a gift that the other spouse did not consent to. He could squander the funds gambling. In any of those cases, the funds would no longer be available for retirement. Practitioners have reported instances where participant spouses have drained their retirement savings accounts to prevent the other spouse from receiving a share during divorce proceedings. Even if the other spouse finds out, they may effectively be without a remedy if the retirement funds are spent and there are a few other assets. And because federal law does not require married IRA holders to name their spouse as a beneficiary, if the participant spouse rolls their 401k account balance into an IRA, they could name a child, a sibling, or a girlfriend as the beneficiary, cutting out the spouse. In all of these instances, marital retirement savings have been placed out of the reach of spouses. Spouses may be deprived of their retirement savings when they need them the most. They may not even find out that the retirement savings they were counting on are gone until their spouse dies. Section four of the discussion draft circulated to this subcommittee would provide robust spousal protections and defined contribution plans and protect spouses against the risks I just described. It would give spouses decision-making power over how and when retirement savings are withdrawn from the account by requiring the default form of benefit to be a qualified joint and survivor annuity or its equivalent. It would not, however, require spousal consent for rollovers to other employer-sponsored DC plans or to IRAs that require spousal consent to have a beneficiary other than the spouse name. Women faced a retirement crisis well before the pandemic and are likely to experience an even more uncertain retirement in its wake. Strengthening spousal rights in defined contribution plans would help ensure that women who rely on their spouse's retirement savings because they have fewer of their own do not bear the risk of their spouse depleting or giving those savings away. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We will now hear from Ms. Handor. Please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, ranking members and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Department of Labor's 2022 Mental Health Parity Report revealed stunning lack of mental health parity compliance by targeted plans and indicates a widespread non-compliance in general. To leverage its resources, the Department of Labor should be given the requested authority to deal directly with insurance carriers and insurers acting as third-party administrators. The relevant terms of insured plans issued by carriers are likely to be administered and be identical by the carrier in the same way. The relevant terms of prototype plans sold by carriers to self-insured employers are also likely to be identical and administered by the insurer acting as a third-party administrator in the same way. If there are violations of mental health parity requirements, either in plan documents or through plan administration, they are likely to show up in all plans insured or administered by the same carrier. DOL could leverage its limited resources if it could correct the problems at the insurer third-party service provider level rather than seeking compliance from each employer individually. DOL should also be given civil penalty enforcement authority for parity violations. Under the current system, there's no financial deterrent. A non-compliant employer has to, only has to fix the non-compliant plan and pay the benefits it should have paid in the first place. If non-compliance results in a stiff penalty, employers will be more likely to comply before DOL knocks on the door. Employers are also more likely to comply if make whole relief is available to participants who have been harmed by benefit denials. This is fair to the injured participant and will incentivize employers to comply or they will have to bear the financial consequences. Compliance will be even more likely if the department is given the authority to make, make whole relief on behalf of all participants who have been, been injured by a violation. But DOL cannot do it alone. Congress intended for participants to have effective remedies and ready access to the federal courts. It is imperative that Congress lift the roadblocks 
that keep participants from protecting their own rights. One major roadblock is a deferential standard of review of benefit determinations. Many plan documents give broad discretion to those deciding benefit claims. Courts review those decisions under an extremely deferential standard of review. Benefits that would have been granted under a de novo standard are not under this discretionary standard. And because these discretionary standards undermine promise coverage, 26 states have banned them from insurance policies issued in their states. They should also be banned in ERISA. And an ERISA ban will protect plan participants' rights to receive hard-earned benefits, and it will ensure uniformity among plans in different states and between insured and self-insured plans. Plan arbitration clauses are another major roadblock to private enforcement. These provisions deny participants their right to litigate their claims in federal court. <laughs> Some also prohibit, prohibit class action lawsuits or limit the participant's ability to obtain relief for the plan as a whole. Some include confidentiality clauses that make it impossible for participants to inform others of fiduciary breaches. These arbitration clauses make it unlikely that a plan participant will challenge even egregious misconduct. Almost always the monetary value of their individual claim will be lost less than the cost of legal representation. And as a result, systemic violations impacting all plan, all plan participants will not be redressed. And in many cases, individual arbitration simply doesn't work with rem the remedial structure of ERISA. Plan investment decisions impact all plan participants in the same way and relief for those violations should be uniform among participants. Individual arbitrations are likely to result in conflicting decisions about fiduciary misconduct and inconsistent and non-uniform remedies for plan participants. There are many other significant roadblocks to effective private enforcement of ERISA as outlined in my written testimony. If we are committed to employer-sponsored health and pension plans, we must give DOL and participants the ability to make them work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Handorf. Uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chairman DeSaulnier, uh, Ranking Member Allen, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My remarks will focus on how environmental, social, and governance considerations should factor into the duties that fiduciaries, such as retirement plan administrators, owe to plan participants. I wish to start by pointing out the overlooked successes of the U.S. retirement system. Despite what you may read about a purported retirement crisis, nearly all indicators of retirement preparedness are pointing in the right direction. More Americans are saving more for retirement than ever before, with savings increasing among every age, income, educational, and racial or ethnic group. Americans are working longer and delaying claiming Social Security benefits. More retirees are receiving benefits from private retirement plans. Retirement income is at record highs across the income distribution, and poverty in old age is at record lows. I'm not Pollyanna-ish when it comes to our retirement system. I point out these successes so that we know what we may put at risk via ill-conceived policies. Under ERISA, fiduciaries are charged with acting solely in the interest of retirement plan participants. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled that those interests should be defined in purely financial terms. Now, it is perfectly reasonable to suppose that environmental, social, and governance factors could affect the financial returns on investment. But here is the problem. To the degree that ESG factors directly affect financial returns, those factors are likely already incorporated into the price of those investments. A firm that is superior in ESG factors in ways that will raise the firm's profits will carry a higher price today before any regulations or legislation has been passed. And a firm whose ESG practices may reduce its profits will trade at a lower price today. Why do I say that? Because today, that is a supposition that we apply to nearly every factor that can affect financial returns. Investors like to make money, and any factor that they believe will affect the firm's profits will be factored into the price they're willing to pay for the firm's stocks. That's true for ESG characteristics, just as is true for whether investors think the new PlayStation or Marvel movie will be a success. The Federal Thrift Savings Plan offers only index funds for precisely that reason. However, I am concerned that regulatory or legislative attempts to force ESG further into the mix could have adverse results. For instance, H.R. 3604 would require that fiduciaries document how they have considered 
economic issues such as local job creation and affordable housing, employee treatment issues such as health, safety, diversity, demographics, human rights, the right to collectively bargain, the prevention of discrimination, child labor, and supply chain management, environmental considerations such as climate issues, species endangerment, environmental justice, worker transitions with respect to the shift to a low carbon economy, and governance considerations such as executive compensation and board diversity. Given that exhaustive list of criteria and the fact that a fiduciary who violates their duties risks being sued, fined, or imprisoned, many fiduciaries might simply opt for an ESG fund to protect themselves, much as physicians practice wasteful precautionary medicine to protect against malpractice suits. I know that both legislation and regulations say that ESG factors should be included only if they don't reduce the value of an investment to the client. But in the real world, including an ESG fund may be seen as an effective safe harbor against legislation or litigation. In an era of increasing lawsuits against foreign 401k plan providers, that may skew fiduciaries' behaviors. But this would effectively negate ERISA's requirements that investors be placed first. The American saving for retirement will be placed after Congress's desire to promote certain public policy goals and after financial advisors desire not to risk litigation for failing to promote Congress's goals. And this could come at the expense of the saver. Research has shown that economically targeted investments conducted by state and local government pension plans are associated with lower investment returns. Other research in peer-reviewed journals finds that ESG investments tend to produce lower risk-adjusted returns than other investments. Likewise, a recent study from the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College found that across nearly every asset class, the 10-year average return on ESG funds trailed that of a comparable Vanguard index fund by an average of over three percentage points annually. One reason for that is, e is that ESG funds carry far higher fees than index funds. I believe fees help account for the rising popularity of ESG funds in the investment industry. In an era of index funds, actively managed ESG funds will be far more profitable to the fund manager, but this often comes at the cost of the investor's own savings. Again, I do not oppose fiduciaries considering any factor that would affect the financial value an investment offers, including ESG. But we should consider carefully either regulations or legislation that will push fiduciaries beyond that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riggs. Perfect. Uh, we will now hear from Mr. Shapiro. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to discuss ways to improve the US retirement system. Um, I'm head of retirement studies and public policy at Morningstar Inc. and Morningstar Investment Management LLC. And I also lead our Center for Retirement and Policy Studies, which released new research this morning uh, addressing some of the issues uh, that we are discussing today and which I excerpted in my written testimony. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on the value of regulatory or statutory clarity on how plan sponsors should use environmental, social governance, uh, or ESG information when selecting investments for the retirement plans. And uh, I have a different perspective uh, from Mr. Biggs, and I'll try to explain uh, why in this brief time. Uh, as requested in my written testimony, I've also covered two additional important issues, uh, fee disclosures uh, and provisions to expand access to lifetime income products and employer-based plans. Morningstar's mission is to empower investor success, and I bring several Morningstar perspectives to this testimony. Uh, we offer a variety of services to retirement plan sponsors and participants, including fiduciary services and managed accounts, so I bring the perspectives of my colleagues who work every day to help investors reach their retirement goals. Morningstar also has specific expertise in ESG analysis, and I've gathered our views on ESG issues from financial professionals across our organization. We categorize and rate different pooled investments, such as mutual funds, based on their ESG attributes. We also identify funds in our database that claim ESG or sustainable investing as core to their investment approach. Uh, second, our equity analysts use ESG as part of their approach to assessing investments. Finally, our sustainalytics uh, division is a leading provider of ESG ratings and data. Let me try to be clear here. We believe proposals to encourage plan sponsors to consider ESG information as part of a prudent process for selecting plan investments, such as the Department of Labor's proposal from last fall, are consistent with common practices that asset managers use to integrate ESG considerations into their investment processes and selections. Uh, ESG risk analysis can be part of any prudent investment analysis and does not need to be called out for special or unique scrutiny. Uh, indeed, many asset managers view ESG risk as a pecuniary matter that is fundamental to evaluating the likely risk-adjusted performance of an investment. This view has become widespread in the past decade. 
and especially the past five years, as ESG issues are increasingly seen as potentially material to the performance of an investment, and as more robust ESG data and analytics have become available, allowing asset managers greater insight into material ESG issues. To be more specific, many firms have some financially material amount of exposure to climate risk. But those without a plan to transition away from fossil fuels or with physical assets vulnerable to severe weather risk may be caught flat-footed in the face of new regulation or environmental realities. Uh, or to take a, another example, uh, companies with poor human capital management may find it very difficult to retain or attract talent to remain competitive in the future. They could also face regulatory risks and reputational risks from customers. Beyond managing ESG risks, participants themselves may want investment options that align with their personal values, especially around sustainability-related issues. To the extent that plan sponsors can offer options that support these values without sacrificing risk-adjusted returns, and over the past half decade, data shows many sustainably-oriented funds have performed well, such investment alternatives could encourage people to save or save more for retirement, furthering the overall goal of enhancing U.S. retirement security. I just want to take a moment to talk about the state of ESG in 401k plans today. Plan sponsors appear to have shied away from considering ESG information and analysis, in part because of regulatory uncertainty. In doing so, uh, sponsors have left the U.S. defined contribution system in the aggregate tilted towards investments with more rather than less ESG risk. Specifically, just 4% of investment options and 2% of assets are in strategies with the lowest levels of ESG risk, but 10% of all strategies rated by Morningstar are in this category. Unless retirement plan sponsors are convinced that ESG risks are overstated, they might want to re-examine their investment choices through an ESG lens. So in some regulatory uncertainty appears to have a real-world impact exposing retirement savers to more risks uh, than might be prudent. Um, I also want to note that in our study, we find about 60% of uh, assets that are not in target date funds, but other uh, designated investment alternative assets uh, are in, in actively managed funds. And you know, many of those, act those managers uh, are considering ESG risks, but some of them are not. So just to, to address what Mr. Big said, uh, I don't think it's the case that all uh, plans are, are using uh, passive investments today. Thank you. Thank you. Under, uh, thank you to all the witnesses. Thank you for being timely in your um, oral comments. Under committee rule 9A, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I'll be recognizing subcommittee members in seniority order. Again, and, and to ensure that the members five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of time. Please be attentive to the time wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. As chair, I will begin by now recognizing myself for five minutes. Ms. Handorf, when ERISA was enacted with overwhelming bipartisan support in 1974, Congress made clear that its legislative purpose was to provide, quote, appropriate remedies, sanctions, and ready access to the federal courts, unquote. Could you briefly explain how, how binding arbitration agreements and class action waivers undermine that core tenet of ERISA? Yes, they definitely do because they, um, they don't give access to, to the federal court. Um, they make it almost impossible to, for participants to seek relief to the plan as a whole, which is generally what you would want to uh, seek if you were trying to correct a fiduciary misconduct mm. with respect to an investment. Um, so in that way, it really, it, it's designed really to keep people out of court rather than to give them access to court. Thanks. Um, in my home state of California, our mental health parity law prohibits insurance companies from including so-called discretionary clauses in health player contracts, health plan contracts. This is an important protection in my view that ensures consumers have a fair review of their benefit claim if necessary in court. Ms. Handorf, how do discretionary clauses make it harder for individuals to access their health benefits? Why is it important that federal ERISA statute be amended to provide nationwide protections for plan participants considering actions like we did in California? Well, I think that when you see the discretionary, the arbitrary and capricious or deferential standard of review in a benefit claim. Um, the court's really looking to see whether there's anything that supports the administrator's decision to deny benefits rather than looking to see whether they're really entitled to benefits. And the evidence indicates that a number of courts have said that 
that they would have granted that that's under de novo standard of review, but because it was a discretionary standard, they deferred to the decision maker. Um, so that really does deny participants their bargain for benefits. Um, the other thing is, is that it, California, that's it's a great example of a state that has concluded that these are not good for individuals covered by insurance policies. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that in, the, that only applies to insurance policies issued in the state of California and the other states that have adopted those provisions. It also only applies to fully insured plans, not to self-insured plans. And in order to have a uniform standard between insured and uninsured plans and between or insured and self-insured plan and uh, between all states, you really do need an ERISA standard. Thanks so much. Um, Mr. Biggs, in your written testimony, um, you say that the California Public Employees Retirement System, uh, CalPERS, quote, uh, cost its participants over 3.6 billion in investment gains over two decades, end quote, by choosing to divest from tobacco products. And you also mentioned that it undercuts its fiduciary duty by not maximizing the financial benefits for its participants. This was based on an article uh, from Wilshire Associates. As you are undoubtedly aware, that same firm, investment consultant firm, Wilshire Associates, said that the $3.6 billion claim, it updated its analysis from that number and said that CalPERS had done better by having a tobacco-free equity portfolio. In fact, they said that CalPERS gained $856 million by holding no tobacco stocks between January 1, 2017 and June 30th, 2020, because those shares lagged behind market during that period. Um, so are you aware of that? And I am respectful of the balance here of responsibility to the investment, but also um, doing that in the context of short, midterm, and longer-term investments. Um, would you care to respond? Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. The $3.6 billion figure I cited has been widely discussed, so it's, it was not reliant entirely on Wilshire. I was not aware of Wilshire's more recent research looking at that. There is a broader picture, though, of looking at economically targeted investments from state and local pension plans. I would refer you to this study from the Center for uh, Retirement Research at Boston College, but others have done it as well. Economically targeted investments are, are have a much longer track record than ESG investments, but they're, they're qualitatively similar. And those have tended to be associated with lower returns for the pension plans that undertook them. So what I was trying to do is highlight the risk of this, that they have a duty to uh, the, the purely financial returns of their participants. And in, in these cases, they, they took uh, choices which seem clearly skewed by a, a, a social desire to to get out of tobacco stocks, and you know, regardless of how that turned out in the end, the research does tend to show that those types of investments are associated with lower returns for state and local pensions. Those are the ones that have used these sorts of economically targeted investments most commonly. I appreciate that, um, and having been on a retirement board uh, when I was a a county elected official during that period of time. Um, I appreciate that, but the dynamics of investment, as I'm sure you would agree, trying to get this balance, uh, and I would include um, the healthcare cost, although the, the legal definition, as you mentioned, uh, we have to be mindful of. With that, um, I'd now like to recognize, I'm told I've recognized that, uh, our distinguished ranking member of the full committee, uh, Ms. Fox, for her questions. And I thank the distinguished chairman for recognizing me. Dr. Biggs, I'm gonna follow up a little bit on um, the line of questioning. Uh, ERISA requires retirement plan fiduciaries to act solely in the interest of plan participants and beneficiaries for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants. In 2014, the US Supreme Court ruled unanimously that under ERISA, the term benefit refers to financial benefits and does not include non-financial benefits. Does the Biden administration's recent proposed rule on ESG investing comply with this Supreme Court decision? And how does the proposed rule treat non-financial factors? 
Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Yeah, as, as I made clear in my uh, written testimony, the, both the, the the written word of ERISA and then court inter various court interpretations show that the the obligation of the fiduciary is solely to the participant and solely to the participant's pecuniary benefits, meaning the financial benefits they get from the investment. That um, other factors such as um, environmental, social, governments, economically targeted investments, those can only matter to the degree that they don't detract from the, the financial returns to participants. Thank now, you for restate. Oh, sorry. I was going to say thank you for restating that. I have a couple other questions. Let right. me try to get those in and then I'll uh, let you come back. In September, uh, P uh, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation stated that while insolvency has been delayed, the, its insurance program for multi-employer pension plans is still likely to go insolvent. Moreover, plans receiving lump sum payments from PBGC may still fail. This is happening despite the taxpayer-funded bailout of underfunded and failing plans in Democrats' so-called American Rescue Plan. Should plans that receive a bailout from PBGC, which have already failed to keep their promises to retirees, be allowed to continue making new promises of benefits, should Congress stop plans from digging a deeper hole? Well, thank you. It's uh, it, it, with a single employer traditional pension, you know, a company offers a pension plan. If that goes insolvent, in general, the plan is frozen meaning the plan cannot continue to promise new benefits. In general, the employees will be switched to 401k plan. Then you figure out of, of the liabilities the plan owes, what can it continue to pay? What can it afford to pay? What happened with the multi-employer pensions is something very different. And what that is, was allowed was that the pensions could continue promising new benefits, despite the fact that they are going to require at least $100 billion in new federal money, simply to pay benefits they've already accrued, Moreover, they're continuing to promise benefits that in the future, those plans will not be able to pay because the federal money is not going to be sufficient to keep them going indefinitely. I, I think the multi-employer uh, situation, both the initial regulation where multi-employer plans were not required to, to fund sufficiently, and then the bailout, I think, to be frank, Congress made a botch of it from the beginning. And I think they should recognize that problem, freeze the plans, and, and then build towards the future. What we have now is not good. Thank you very much. Thanks for reiterating that. Uh, Dr. Biggs, a provision in the chairman's discussion draft requires an individual to receive the written notarized consent of his or her spouse before taking a distribution from the retirement plan. One of the many benefits of the 401k type plan is the flexibility it provides participants to take distributions in times of emergency, which we witnessed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Does the discussion draft adequately consider instances when a notarized consent may be impractical or harmful to participants, including for wives who need emergency access? Thank you. I have seen cases like the one raised by Ms. Matsui, where one spouse would attempt to, to drain an account, and that, that's a real problem. At the same time, though, you could have cases where, say, in spousal abuse, where, you know, would, would the abused spouse be required to get her uh, abuser's consent? More generally, DC plans like 401ks, withdrawals like that are much, much more common than with traditional pensions. I just think this needs additional study to quantify how often these issues come up and what are the best way to balance things. I, don't, I just don't think there's a perfect you know, cookie cutter solution to this. Sure. Now, I've, I've got you off track in your first answer. Is there anything else that you want to add to that that I'm, you didn't get a chance to say? Well, I, I think the, the material effect of the regulations or legislation on ESG is going to be to push uh, fiduciaries to over-consider ESG factors, not to consider to allow to the extent that's allowed on the paper of the law, but to, but to over-consider them. And I think that is inconsistent with the spirit of the law, but also could reduce financial returns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My pleasure, Ms. Fox. Uh, now recognize Mr. Courtney for five minutes. Mr. Courtney. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, uh, again, thank you, Mark, for mentioning uh, the Work Act and Work Act in your opening remarks, which is uh, a bill that myself and Mark Pukan have uh, introduced, along with Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, to help promote ESOPs. Um, 
employee stock ownership uh, plans, which is um, you know a great uh, model for uh, businesses that uh, allow their workers, their employees to become co-owners. And that creates obviously uh, a really healthy incentive in terms of people's buy-in to you know, the success of companies. And it also provides a really extremely um, strong retirement um, uh, you know, option in terms of stock ownership. Uh, they, the data shows that ESOPs outperform 401ks uh, by a wide margin. And this bill, which is a very benign bill, will allow um, uh, departments of labor to really give uh, technical assistance to companies who want to make that conversion purely voluntary. But there clearly is a need to, to increase people's understanding of ESOPs, and that bill will, will help provide it. I would, however, like to just pivot for a second to um, the issue of mental health parity. Uh, again, I was here along with a couple of the other veterans on the committee when we passed uh, the Wellstone bill that created the Mental Health Parity Act. And one of the provisions was to have the Department of Labor every two years give a report in terms of um, how well we're doing. The report that was just um, uh, uh, finished by the Department of Labor, uh, unfortunately, you know, had a lot of uh, shocking uh, data in terms of the number of violations by health plans um, and insurers. And I'd like to ask Ms. Handorf, um, again, just sort of just, again, your take on that report and, and um, you know, some of the suggestions, including, um, you know, beefing up enforcement and Don Norcross's bill, I think is really going to go a long ways to, to helping with us with that. But again, maybe you could just sort of comment a little more um, directly in terms of, the, of that report. Yes, I think that the report is rather shocking and the non-compliance. Um, it's not shocking, really, if you look at the employer-sponsored health care in general, because really what you see is a system in which insurance companies, either acting as insurers or third-party administrators to plans, are really running these plans, and the employers are really not paying a whole lot of attention to compliance. Um, they think that once they've signed the contract, that's the end of it. So if the Department of Labor can... Um, deal with the insurers and the third party administrators directly, they will be able to get compliance in all of the plans that are administered or insured by those third party administrators. And that will be much more effective than to going to each individual employer and trying to get compliance. Um, I also think that the penalty provisions will put the employers on notice that they need to be paying attention to what's in their plans. And that if they don't, they're going to get a financial penalty. Or if you give make whole relief, the ability for the department to get make whole relief for violations, that will be a further incentive because there will be some financial harm that will come along to an employer that doesn't comply with the statute. So I fully support those recommendations. Great, thank you. I mean, one thing that I think, um, you know, the shared experience before COVID of, um, you know, the opioid crisis and, you know, what that has really done in terms of, um, you know, creating tremendous demand for substance abuse um, and mental health services. Uh, my experience in terms of talking to substance abuse and mental health providers is, is that they really struggle to a much greater degree, you know, interacting with private health plans versus uh, Medicaid. And, um, you know, it just, it kind of screams out that, you know, we, we really um, can't allow that kind of disparity and the COVID behavioral health overhang is just gonna aggravate that situation even more. So again, I mean, we're, this is not a very discreet problem. This is a problem that's actually gonna be growing uh, in, the, in the wake of COVID and obviously opioid um, addiction hasn't disappeared. And maybe again, you're based on your experience, whether or not that's what you're seeing in that sector of healthcare. I'm seeing it in that sector of healthcare, but I think that's across the board with not just mental health parity. I think that the inefficiencies in our current system have driven up prices, um, both for employers and for participants who are paying premiums and high co deductibles. And I think that while transparency is a really fine thing, um, you really need employers to feel compelled to look at how their insurers and third party administrators are administering the plants. And if they did, they would find a lot of things that would be rather shocking. Um, so I think that we have to have a, a vibrant enforcement of those provisions, and that comes by giving the department more authority and also strengthening private enforcement. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. We'll now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Biggs, in 20, 
20, the Trump Administration Department of Labor issued a final rule prohibiting ERISA retirement plan fiduciaries from uh, subordinating the financial interest of workers' retirement savings to other unrelated or collateral objectives, such as investing in uh, investments based on in environmental, social, governments, or ESG factors. Why is it important that investment decisions be based only on financial factors that are relevant to the risk of return on an investment? I think it's important because an ERISA plan, you know, a 401k, is generally superior as a retirement vehicle to something that is not covered by ERISA, say an IRA plan. And you want to keep people participating in those plans, but if, they're, if they don't feel the faith their best interests are being looked after, they may choose to go elsewhere. So we want to have people invested in, in, in these plans. Maybe I can clarify a little bit. Let's see, we have some seeming disagreement on some of the ESG factors. Right? I'm not sure how much there really is. I don't disagree that these factors could affect the profits generated by a firm. But if you have a firm that is vulnerable to these factors, the CEO and the management of the firm, they have the financial incentive to address as best they can. Next, existing financial market participants, there's hundreds of millions of people investing in these firms. They then will weigh in and they will not pay as high a price for a firm that has not addressed these factors. It's only, at that point, you've really gotten on top of it, I think. Considering it on top of that, you're assuming that the fiduciaries who are being pushed into these considerations by ESG regulations, you're assuming they know something that both the managers of the firm and the investors in the market already don't. If there's one thing we've learned over the past 20 to 30 years is that active management often falls short of simply investing in, in the market index. ESG is active management like, any, like anything else. And so I think there's just a risk of not doing as well for, for your clients. Well, it, it looks like that just focusing on uh, the actual financial returns protects savers and retirees. Uh, and, and they re rely on these planned fiduciaries to, uh, to make the decisions on their behalf. And it's important that they have the freedom to do this versus some um, you know, one size fits all top down rule from Department of Labor saying, oh, OK, if you're going to get tax deferred benefit uh, retirement savings, you got to invest so much percentage in this. I mean, it, this administration has already been picking winners and losers. So, I mean, don't you think that the best protection for the in, uh, for the plan holders is to have the freedom to 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 use their fiduciaries to give them the proper advice rather than uh, the Biden administration? Sure. I mean, I, look, I have no doubt that proponents of ESG-based uh, investing think they are doing the best thing for the planet, the best thing um, you know, for workers, the best thing for governors. I, I, don't, I don't doubt their motives on that. At the same time, though, I, I, I also don't doubt that the effect of these regulations is going to be to push uh, uh, fiduciaries in, in a direction that may overcompensate for this. Perhaps I could just touch back on a question that came up um, in Chairman DeSolnia's questioning earlier, looking at CalPERS and their economically targeted investments. And I had said that over a 20 year period, they lost $3.6 billion, according to Wilshire. Uh, Wilshire, according to the chairman, had said that over the past three years, they had made $850 million from this. What that nets out is over 20 years, they still lost several billion dollars by investing in, in tobacco. And that, that was very clearly driven by a desire to sort of get out of the business of a harmful product. And I don't blame people for wanting to do that, but that did come at the expense of, of their participants. And I just think that the record overall of doing these things of actually benefiting the participants is not very strong, but that is in fact the standard. That's what ERISA says. If we want to change ERISA, that's fine. Right. But the standard on there is it has to be in the financial best interest of the participants. And I think in a, it, too much emphasis on the ESG factors is, is going to detract from that. Well, you know, obviously the Biden administration designed, you know, signed the executive order protecting public health and environmental restore, and restoring science to tackle the climate uh, crisis. That executive order directs all federal agencies to review, revise, and rescind guidance that is consistent with prioritizing environmental justice and the creation of well-paying union jobs. 
you know, that's what we're up against. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Hopefully another member of the committee can follow through on this question. And with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Biggs, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I will now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, since I walked through these doors back in 2014, you've been focused on the golden years. You work your whole life, you play by the rules, you expect at the end of that, that your retirement will take you through those golden years. But unfortunately, we found there are many impediments to that. Uh, certainly, when we look at uh, study by CNN Money, the percentage of workers in private sectors whose only retirement account is a defined pension benefit is down to 4%, down from 60%. That's how much that has changed since 1980. Today, only about 14% of companies have a combined of both types. Instead, uh, they have a 401, and the 401 is typically not an option for workers to replicate that what we call a lifetime income option, a feature of defined ben benefit pension that we all know well. Uh, Mr. Wahlberg and I have introduced a bill, the Lifetime Income for Employees Act, that allows that to happen. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, with the decline of defined benefit pensions, is there a concern that people with 401s could retire and outlive what they've saved? Yeah, absolutely. And oh, I'm sorry. And just follow up to that, and speaking of that, is it a good idea to increase lifetime income for floor ones? I think, thank you so much for the question. Um, I mean, this has been a perennial issue for decades, you know, finding ways to ensure people in defined contribution plans do not outlive their savings. Um, you know, I, I fully agree that policy that could help more workers um, hedge this longevity risk uh, could, could help more retirees uh, achieve their retirement goals. And uh, that this, um, you know, when you look at the studies out there, um, almost all of them will show uh, many, many Americans would benefit from an increase in guaranteed income um, in retirement. And that's only going to increase uh, as more and more people uh, exit the defined benefit system as the wave of defined contribution only workers begins to retire. Uh, of course, there's a reason they call this lack of annuitization the annuity puzzle. Um, it's been a, a very hard problem to solve. And I do think it's important to consider that, that retirees have a, a wide variety of lifetime income needs depending on, on their, you know, their preferences for bequests to maintain liquidity. Uh, their savings levels, uh, the replacement rate that they'll receive through Social Security and other factors. Nonetheless, uh, providing greater access to lifetime income solutions uh, is incredibly important. And, and our view is to the extent that it can come with, with education, particularly personalized education, so that participants uh, can feel confident that the annuity recommendation, especially a, a recommendation uh, into, uh, you know, in, in a liquid a permanent election into an annuity product uh, is right for them. We think if participants have that confidence, uh, there would be a, a, a you know, big uptake. And if those options were available inside defined contribution plans, inside 401k plans. Uh, so this is a, a very important issue and it's only going to get more important. Thank you for your response. Certainly, uh, we want everybody's golden years. I want to thank the committee for coming together on bipartisan. We might have some different nuances but we all agree that if you work hard, you should be able to retire in those golden years. Uh, a report that uh, Joe Courtney was just talking about is Parity Enforcement Equity Act. It's been on the books for a long time. Uh, you talked about some of the enforcement capabilities the bill that is included, and we appreciate the chairman putting that in. The Parity Enforcement Act. If you could... Uh, Define for us and walk through what happens now to an insurance company who doesn't include that. Uh, Ms. Handler, if an insurance company elects not to provide that mental health, as bad as it is out there right now in the pandemic, what happens to that company? The insurance it, company? They get caught. Nothing. <laughs> um, they have to pay nothing. for the bill, right? Well, the only thing that happens is they have to comply. I have to pay the benefits if it's a fully insured plan. If it's a self-insured plan, the employer has to pay the benefits. But but that's basically it. And you know, it's there's so many barriers to participants who want to enforce their own rights to mental health parity. Um, you know, you have to have a lawyer. You have to go through an appeals procedure in which your lawyer doesn't represent you or doesn't get paid for it. You are limited in what type of information you can get and what information you can present. 
you have anti-assignment provisions and plans. All of those are barriers to participants getting their benefits paid. And on top of it, they're dealing with mental illness in some cases. So, you know, all of those things need to be fixed in order for the system to work. Um, strengthen employees' rights and strengthen the department's rights to enforce. No, it, it, it's time to put some enforcement. Nobody's looking to hurt people, but my gosh, if we hadn't figured out mental health is just as important as physical health, uh, we as a country are going to face some terrible times. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. We'll now recognize Mr. Wahlberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the panel for being with us on an important topic. Uh, whenever this committee has approached the subject of retirement policy, we've done so generally in a spirit of bipartisanship. Uh, that spirit still exists and is highlighted by the LIFE Act, which was introduced by my colleague, Representative Norcross, and myself, as he's indicated already. The LIFE Act will help guard against savers outliving their retirement savings by expanding the accessibility of products that provide guaranteed life income. Uh, approximately 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day, many of whom are expected to live up to 30 years in retirement. If, if we're to address anxiety workers and retirees feel about their ability to accumulate sufficient income that will last throughout their retirement years, we must continue the bipartisan progress Congress has made to improve defined uh, contribution system. Uh, however, uh, I have significant concerns about some of the other approaches we are discussing today and the policy priorities of the current administration. It appears the Department of Labor is looking to revive its flawed 2016 fiduciary rule, a regulation which would have made it drastically more difficult and costly for families to save for retirement. Uh, Dr. Biggs, um, should the DOL revive the fiduciary rule uh, how would lower to middle income savers be impacted? Well, the likely impact of uh, reinstating the fiduciary rule is that it would raise the cost of financial advice, particularly, or be in, in a most salient way for low and middle income savers. And the reason is that currently part of that advice is, is paid through fees um, that the, the fiduciary receives or the, the participant receives otherwise, but those fees would have to be charged up front. Back in 2013, the United Kingdom went in, it had a very similar regulation where uh, advisors would have to act as fiduciaries. And several uh, studies that I've seen there have shown that it, it tended to increase the cost of financial advice for, for low income savers. And it did so in a way it raised that upfront cost more than those savers were willing to, to pay. So over in the UK, they call this the guidance gap. Yeah. Where, you know, for some people it worked very well, for high income people still got the financial advice, but it made it harder for low income people to do it. So, you know, in theory, you know, I, the, the, the fiduciary rule sounds great, but we always have to think of what are the other effects of this. And we don't want to cut people off from financial advice. So I think it's just thinking about how we balance these concerns. Yeah, we definitely want to get people started. If we get started, it's kind of like potato chips. You just keep eating. And uh, to make it difficult and costly, I don't get it. And I believe that's uh, why this rule was invalidated by the federal court in 2018. Uh, how will the department be able to revive it, even though it was blocked by the court? And will the department be flouting the court's ruling, do you think? Congressman, I, I'm going to credit you in the future for the potato chips analogy. That's a very good one. It's I, I'm a, a policy person, economist, not a, not an ERISA lawyer. So I, you, know, you want to take that for what it's worth. Um, but the, the court ruling on the original fiduciary rule, which had came out in 2018, simply said that the DOL had gone beyond their, their legal rights in doing that. So I think if you wanted to go that route again, I think you'd have to do it through legislation rather than than through regulation. And, you know, in, in general, that's how I think things should be done. I mean, Congress, people should agree on how you want to do that. That will tend to produce a compromise that'll be more lasting over time than having different administrations change regulatory rules. Yeah. Um, the Trump administration issued a revised rule regarding investment advice in 2020, and full compliance with that rule does not go into effect until June of this year. 
In your view, uh, Dr. Biggs, does it make sense for the department to pursue a new fiduciary rule when full compliance with the current rule has not occurred? And wouldn't it be wise to see how the current rule is working before you try to change it? Now, I would stick with what we have, see how it plays out, and then and then reconsider in the future. Um, I think just trying to jump back in on something which many people think could be harmful, but also is invalidated in court. I, I think you're just setting yourself up for trouble. So let's just see how things go, study it, and then look to improve it in the future. I concur. And uh, seeing I have very limited time, I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. We will now go to another, another member of the Michigan delegation. Uh, Ms. Stevens, you're recognized. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I couldn't be more grateful for today's uh, just incredibly topical hearing. And I, I really want to commend my colleagues, um, Congresswoman Macbeth, uh, for her discussion draft bill that uh, is, uh, you know, in formulation. And I know she's working hard on that. I've got a chance to talk with her about it. Obviously, um, Congressman Norcross uh, for his work alongside Mr. Wahlberg uh, for the Lifetime Income for Employees Act as well. We're, we're working on these annuity contracts, which is which is just going to be very important. And Ms. Matsui, in, in particular, thank you for, for your testimony today and to, to everybody, uh, all of our distinguished witnesses. Uh, but Ms. Matsui, in particular, you noted that women uh, confront economic challenges and face workplace pay and retirement savings inequities. Uh, certainly in my home state of Michigan, uh, it has been reported uh, to a, just a recent March 2021 report from the Michigan Bureau of Labor Market Information and Strategic Initiatives that women in Michigan experienced a sharp drop in employment in April 2020 due to the pandemic. So what comes next? Loss of <laughs> retirement savings. And so this was you know, documented to be a longer period than it was for, for men. And Frankly, women have just failed to, to recover. And as the report notes that between February and December of 2020, roughly 136,000 women left the labor force. And unfortunately, this is likely to have dramatic impact on lifetime earnings and retirement savings. So Ms. Masui, um, is this uh, reflective of what's been happening nationally when it comes to the pandemic's impact of women? Thank you very much for the question, Representative Stevens. We have in fact seen significant employment impacts on women from the pandemic. So over 1.8 million net jobs have been lost since February, 2020. And I'll also note that nearly a million women have left the labor force altogether. One of the things about retirement is that it, it's premised on the time value of money. Um, the assumption is if you start early, if you continue to invest, the cumulative impact of um, just continuing to contribute and interest means that you'll have a nest egg at retirement. But unfortunately, the converse is also true. When there are disruptions to employment, when people aren't able to save or to contribute, that sets retirement off track. And so there is, I think, a significant concern that um, the impacts of the pandemic will be to further derail women's retirement security. And for some women later in their careers, it may be too late to make up the difference. You know, when people are kind of at the height, presumably, of their income, that's the time when they're supposed to add additional savings, additional cushion. If they're not able to do that, and in fact, if they've been having to rely or withdraw those retirement savings, their own retirement can be delayed or indefinitely deferred. Yeah, and I noticed your testimony cites research suggesting younger workers entering the job market in a period of high unemployment may experience uh, reduced earnings for up to 10 years, as well as reduced job mobility. Could you elaborate on that based on what you were also just talking about? I'm happy to, thank you for the question. So this is really something that we saw, you know, kind of for millennials after the last recession, they left school with a lot of debt, they found you know, jobs at lower pay with less mobility. And it really is a challenge, especially for workers at the beginning of their career, when they're paying off student loans, their, um, their salaries are lower, they can't save for homes, they can't pay off their debt, they may defer having children. And of all of those things, it seems so far off to start saving for retirement that they don't begin to accumulate the savings that they can that they um, need to for the, the length of their, um, of their careers. 
So just to the extent that we're seeing disparities for pay for women across the board, as soon as they start in the labor force and throughout their lives, there is also going to be a, a disparity for women, even among younger workers. Yeah, sure. And, and let me actually just conclude on a, a point as, as well, because I served in the uh, U.S. Department of the Treasury for a number of years, and we did a fair amount of financial education, uh, particularly around retirement. We remember when we rolled out the My RIA and things along those lines uh, that have been really important. And we do, we do need to not only educate ourselves as members of Congress, uh, particularly around some of these disparities, but we, we need to make sure that we've got transparency for the American people. So with that said, Mr. Chairman, we hope the American people are tuning in today for our hearing, our subcommittee hearing, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Well, this subcommittee always gets a big crowd of viewers. With that, we will recognize uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can't talk about retirement security without talking about social security. And I want to turn our, our attention to that for a moment as we expect social, social, social security be to, to be insolvent by 2033. In fact, the social, social security and disability insurance programs experience a $3 trillion increase in their unfunded obligations since just last year. Dr. Biggs, what would happen to benefits for current social security recipients once the program becomes insolvent? Well, thank you, Congressman. I would say at the outset that uh, if Social Security was handled the same level of bipartisanship that private retirement savings are, I think we could have fixed the problem. There really is a contrast between how private retirement savings initiatives work where there's tons of bipartisanship and Social Security, which is much more contentious. But you know, people warn of a retirement crisis, which I think is just in general entirely unwarranted. But if Social Security becomes insolvent, the trust fund runs out legally, it can only pay benefits with the money it collects, that would imply an across the board benefit cut of somewhere north of 25% for not just new retirees, but existing retirees, the disabled survivors, that's where you get your retirement crisis from. Um, so that would be a very concerning uh, event. Thank you. Um, as you know, many Americans receiving benefits today cannot afford to have their benefits cut due to rampant inflation and soaring costs. So Dr. Biggs, what will happen to benefits for our children and grandchildren if benefits for current Social Security recipients are not lowered? Well, it's a little bit of a complex issue in the sense that Social Security is a pay-as-you-go program. I mean, the taxes I pay today aren't saved for me. They go straight out the door to pay for you know, my grandparents or whatever. Um, so really, the benefits available in the future are going to be premised on the, the wage base in the future and the, uh, the, the taxes that are, that are levied then. So I, I think the key thing is we want to get this on a sustainable track. You don't want to have cliffs where at some point some dramatic change happens. We have known for 30 years precisely what is going wrong with Social Security. If you read an article in the New York Times today, it is essentially the same as an article from 1990. What is lacking is not information, what is lacking is political will, which is to tell people that the deal you were promised can't be held up. You're either going to have to pay more in or get less out. And, and people can make their choices, but we just need to be honest up front with people and tell them the sooner you do this, the easier it's going to be. Social Security's unfunded obligations are now at an astounding $20 trillion. This means that to fund all obligations without reducing benefits, every single American household would have to pay $154,000. Dr. Biggs, is it economically viable to simply raise taxes to offset Social Security obligations and interest? And who would bear the main burden of such a proposed tax increase? Well, you know, in you know, in theory, you can. I mean, there are countries with very, very high uh, social security taxes. The issue, though, is first, you know, raising the, the payroll tax. That's a tax on labor. That's going to reduce incentives to work. Um, it, it's all. It leaves less money, particularly for lower income people, to save for retirement on on their own. So this is a a you know, it's it's a costly kind of thing to do. My own view on this is that we should maintain and strengthen the safety net for, for lower income Americans. That's not very expensive to do. Most other countries do it. But what we need to do is middle and upper income people need to rely more 
on their own savings, less on social security in the future. That doesn't mean a dramatic cut, that doesn't mean anybody's zeroed out, but it means we just transition to a, a system in the future where middle and upper income people are saving more on their own, relying less on a tax and transfer system from the government. Many countries do that, you know, Australia, United Kingdom, it, it's not crazy, and but it, it actually will work. So give us uh, one, one more piece of advice, Dr. Bates, with the minute that we have left. What You talked about bipartisanship. What's that one bipartisan solution that we need to take to reduce the burden on American taxpayers to reform Social Security and do what we need to do? <laughs> that is, that, that's, the, that's the tough one. Um, if we were back in the late 1990s, you had a whole number of truly bipartisan bills. They could have passed a, a bipartisan plan then. Today, it's... The, if you look at something like the Social Security 2100 Act, that has shifted to not just fixing the problem entirely with tax increases, but doing more than that, raising taxes above what's needed to pay for full benefits and increasing benefits further. So I think everybody needs to get a little more realistic about what they can actually pass. A completely Republican plan won't pass. A completely Democratic plan won't pass. You really do need to meet in the middle. And that's where, you know, go have lunch with your colleagues and, and see what they're open to. All right, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Banks and Mr. Biggs, I'll be happy to go to lunch with both of you. We'll recognize Ms. Wild. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, and I would like to recognize you as well as our colleague, Representative Lucy McBath, for your leadership on the important retirement and health care issues being considered by the subcommittee this morning. I am proud that legislation I plan to introduce as part of Representative McBath's discussion discussion draft legislation, the Department of Labor requires 401k plans to provide workers with information about the fees that they pay on their retirement investments. Several years ago, our committee asked the, government, the GAO to look into this information and assess its usefulness. And last August, the agency issued an eye-opening report. It found that almost 40% of 401k plan participants do not fully understand the fees they are paying on their retirement accounts, and many are unaware that they are even paying fees. Clearly, there is more work to do here to help workers better understand these fees and, and that they are paying fees on their retirement investments. So I am leading a bill to have the Labor Department review these rules and explore how they can be improved. I think it's a straightforward, common sense idea that will benefit workers in all of our districts and make this work easier for employers and plan sponsors. With that, Mr. Shapiro, I appreciate that your testimony focuses in part on retirement plan fees. Based on your understanding of the data, do you agree with GAO's findings that far too many Americans do not understand the fees that they are paying and that the Labor Department should give the relevant uh, re regulation a fresh look? Thanks so much for the question. Yeah, I'd have a hard time uh, disagreeing with my uh, former colleagues at GAO on this study. I think it's uh, very clear, and, and we see that also through um, sort of practical experience. Um, Morningstar has long advocated uh, for increased fee transparency into retirement plan lineups, and I think a review of these uh, 404A5 disclosures that participants are supposed to get and understand uh, is certainly called for. I'd also note that Congress could consider directing the department to review the publicly available fee disclosures that plans provide, and that's on the Form 5500. And that might help uh, plan sponsors, regulators, and EBSA itself, uh, and third-party benchmark providers better understand the fees uh, in a lineup uh, that a plan is offering, and that would ultimately help the sponsors assess whether those are reasonable and, and improve plans for, for all participants. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, this, this sort of discussion around fees, it, it's not an academic debate. We put out research this morning looking at the variance in fees across different plans, and there are some plans that are quite expensive. There are a lot that are quite good, and it's really important that participants understand uh, what they're paying, uh, where they sit, uh, particularly as they make decisions around rollovers uh, and the like. This can really materially impact uh, their future nest egg. And in addition, your written testimony also details the difference in fees that are being paid depending on the size of a retirement plan. That is that the larger the retirement plan, the less expensive it is likely to be for its workers to invest for retirement. Is this correct? And if so, would you agree with me that it seems to indicate that for those Americans who work for a small business, it's even more imperative that they understand the fees they're paying? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, you know, at the median, the fees uh, for people at, at smaller plans that are offered by smaller businesses can be almost double uh, the median fee for those for those larger plans. And so it really is important for people to understand that what they pay for retirement may be dependent on their employer. I, I do want to note we see a lot of variability with small plans. So there are some that are that are quite inexpensive, but a lot that are in that long tail. And you know, most people are covered by large plans. That, that makes sense. But um, there are lots of people uh, who, uh, you know, may be paying quite a bit more than they think they are and, and really need to understand that. Thank you so much. With that, I yield back. Thank you. We'll now recognize Representative Fitzgerald. For five uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just had uh, kind of a, a quick one that, that I thought it, it might take some uh, explanation, but um, Dr. Biggs, one of the provisions that uh, Chairman Scott uh, has in that uh, discussion draft, it, it prevents a spouse from taking a distribution from a retirement account without the knowledge of the other spouse. Doesn't seem, I, I, I thought it was odd that this was included and I was trying to figure out, you know, why would this be? And it's kind of a strange precedent, I would think. So I, I, what I wanted to know is how frequently are retirement assets used by one spouse for non-retirement expenses without the knowledge of the other spouse? Is that something that happens? And it's just something that kind of stuck out in, uh, in, in the actual discussion draft. Well, thanks, uh, Congressman. The answer is we don't really know. And I think I touched on this a little bit in, in my earlier discussion of this, where I think it'd be good to have better data to the degree it's possible on, on how this plays out. Um, you know, perhaps there are some plans that already require this. Maybe we can test how much it's happening. W with all of these issues that we're, we're thinking about, whether it's ESG, spousal consent, fiduciary role, there, these are not easy issues. You know, the, the easy decisions have already been made by your predecessors. Now you get left with the, the harder ones where you're balancing different priorities. And so I think with this, I would just want to look um, further on it. With all of these, I'm concerned with unintended consequences. We're trying to do the right thing, but then it may have um, bad effects we haven't anticipated. So I think the more we can study it up front, the better off we are. Yeah, and I guess that was my point in, in bringing it up was, it, it, it appears that a lot of these areas, there's either been some precedent set in retirement planning in the past, or there's been um, kind of just a complete negligence in addressing these. So it, um, it, even though the draft looks fairly clear, there's more complex issues that could emerge as, as implementation happened. You think that's true? Exactly. I mean, it's it, this yeah. is just a more complex issue than when we're looking at traditional defined benefit pensions, where you, you essentially made one decision. Now is that these are people could be taking loans, they could be taking emergency withdrawals. It's just a more complicated issue, I think. Yeah, very good. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald. And we'll now recognize Congresswoman McBath. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our guests who have joined us to talk about these really pressing matters. I have read all of your testimonies, and I know the hardworking individuals deserve to retire with security and dignity, and I'm proud of this, the work that this committee has done to improve and secure the retirement benefits for millions of Americans, whether through the RISE Act or through the saving of multi-employer pension plans, my colleagues and I really remain steadfast in our commitment to the American worker. And I'm pleased to continue that work with today's hearing, which is really focused in part on draft legislation that I plan to file in the coming weeks. And this common sense legislation truly adds you know, further protections and clarification for benefit holders and financial managers. And I thank each of my colleagues, such as Representative Wild and others that have contributed to creating these, this really important pack, package of bills. Uh, one of its key aspects is extending spousal protections that are currently available for tra traditional defined benefit pensions to defined contribution plans like 401ks, which we're just discussing now. And this provision is also a part of legislation our colleague, Representative Underwood of Illinois, introduced, and I thank her for her leadership. For many families in my own district and across the country, their 401k plan is often their largest asset outside their home. Yet there's a loophole in current law that is uh, being exploited, allowing one spouse 
to make a withdrawal from a 401k plan without the other spouse's knowledge or consent. And women who are far more often uh, have fewer assets and retirement benefits than men are the ones who are far more likely to be harmed by this loophole. Ms. Matsui, thank you for your thoughtful and compelling testimony. Testimony, And I have a few questions to emphasize uh, what's at stake and why Congress really needs to act. Let's say one spouse retires or changes jobs and decides to withdraw a 401k balance that was intended to serve as a retirement nest egg for both spouses. Is there anything in current law to stop the spouse from depleting this account? Thank you very much for the question for this important legislation, Representative McBath. Right now, if a withdrawal is made, there is nothing to prevent one spouse, the participant spouse from depleting those assets. I will say that, you know, for um, in, in some limited circumstances, if there is a divorce pending, there may be a requirement to kind of hold those assets or think about those, but it's often very difficult to practically protect those since, as you noted, the 401k or retirement savings plan could be the biggest asset in the marriage. And if they are those, if those assets or funds are spent or depleted, there's not really a way to recoup them or get them back. By okay. the same token, some states do have, in, only in common law states, though, have protections in IRAs. But again, those are not comprehensive, and there really is no recourse, especially since spouses may not find out until their spouse has passed away. Okay, thank you. You just answered my next question that there is no recourse for that spouse. So I can see how this would be a major issue for couples in anticipation of a divorce. Can you speak to a little, a little bit more to that? Yes, and thank you for the question. So uh, because um, pension benefits and retirement savings that are accumulated during a marriage are effectively marital property, it's deferred compensation. So it belongs to kind of the marital unit the one spouse does have kind of a right to a share as marital property. While those benefits can be um, divided at divorce, again, there are, um, there's a concern that if those funds are depleted, they're not kind of available and ready. And in addition, there are sometimes considerations of, you know, trade-offs or one spouse may be interested in keeping the house so it's not always kind of a guarantee that a spouse will get their share. All of these are points where retirement savings can be lost and spouses can be put at risk for a less secure retirement. Right. So let's say this becomes law. Can you talk about how these spousal consent provisions would be implemented and administered by retirement plan sponsors? Yes, thank you. Um, for almost four decades, retirement plans who administer defined benefit plans have been effectuating and implementing um, spousal consent provisions. And in addition, the Federal Thrift Savings Plan for FERS recipients does also have spousal protections for their defined contribution plans. So um, if, for example, a participant rolls the account balance over to another defined contribution plan that's employer sponsored or to an IRA where there are spousal protections, no consent would be required, but there are there's kind of ample precedent. Plans have been doing this for almost 40 years to be able to put these protections in place. But thank you so much. I'm out of time and I look forward to continuing to work on this really vital legislation with my colleagues and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we will now recognize Mr. Levin for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for convening this hearing. I've long opposed the previous administration's efforts to stymie environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, sustainable investing. I introduced two bills, the Sustainable Investment Policies Act and the Retirees Sustainable Investment Opportunities Act to protect and promote transparency in this area. Workers should be able to invest in accordance with their values relating to environmental sustainability, workers' rights, and corporate governance. And contrary to what some may say, this kind of sustainable investing is not at odds with making a profit. In fact, workers' profit motives are central. If a company has negative practices, such as high liability risks, poor treatment of workers, even in their supply chains, or carbon-intensive business practices, their stock could suffer in the long term. Retirement plan fiduciaries should be able to consider such factors when making investment decisions for their participants. 
That's exactly what the Biden-Harris administration's proposed ESG rule seeks to do, and I'm a strong supporter of it. For today, I want to explore two important issues, the performance of ESG funds and the necessity of this Biden-Harris administration regulation. So Mr. Shapiro, in Mr. Biggs' testimony, he cites studies questioning the performance of ESG funds. Based on Morningstar's extensive study of the data, have you seen underperformance with ESG funds? Oh, thanks so much for the question. And, and we really have not. Uh, we put out every year the Sustainable Funds Landscape Report. Uh, we published the most recent one in January of this year. And what we find when we look across all sustainable funds with different kinds of strategies, funds that incorporate ESG information, ESG information into their uh, investment process, what we find is slightly more than half of those funds finish in the top half of their Morningstar category by return. So at least looking retrospectively, there's really no there there to the argument that these funds systematically or, or generally underperform conventional funds. And I want to emphasize that that is all net of fees. Uh, in previous years, we found sustainable funds have actually performed, have been more likely to perform quite a bit better than conventional funds. Um, Mr. Biggs also cited uh, the uh, CRR study, and I, and I think it's an interesting study, but just in, in a nutshell, I, I don't think that its findings support the notion uh, that ERISA DC plans uh, should not consider ESG information or that the Department of Labor's regulation uh, should not be promulgated. Um, they look at, and I'm just quoting from the study here, uh, a whole range of approaches uh, that run uh, the gamut of, of state mandates uh, and ESG policies. So I don't think they're really capturing the kind of ESG analysis that the regulation the Department of Labor is considering would promote. Exactly. Well, so the, I really want to sort of put a fine point on that because you know, the, clearly in his testimony, Mr. Biggs questions whether the proposed ESG rule is even necessary at all. And he seems to argue that plans are already doing this and the market is already pricing it in. So based on Morningstar's study of the data, are plans accounting for ESG factors and is the proposed ESG regulation needed? I think it absolutely is. And in my written testimony, um, I provide some charts and figures on this, but I think that the bottom line is something I alluded to earlier and I want to come back to. 4% of strategies, 2% of assets that we can identify, around 3 trillion in assets we can identify uh, in the defined contribution system, are in funds that we call five globe. That is that they are best prepared to address uh, ESG risks. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, it's clear to me that plan sponsors are, uh, you know, afraid of considering these issues um, because of the regulatory uncertainty, and that doing so would benefit participants because it would allow the plans to say, okay, we are considering uh, whether these risks are financially material and what they will mean for your future retirement. Well, thanks. And, you know, I really appreciate you underscoring the importance of the Biden-Harris administration's proposed ESG rule. I plan to file legislation to codify the rule once it's finalized by DOL because Congress also needs to provide long lasting clarity to plan fiduciaries. And I welcome my colleagues support for this bill. You know, you said something else in your testimony that I really believe, or I'm gonna expand on it because this is what I think anyway. Young people, young workers don't save nearly enough for their retirement. And part of the reason is they're not interested. It doesn't seem to meet their needs. Letting them invest their values in ways that also maximize their returns over time will get a lot more young people into the game when they need to start saving for their retirement. That's what we need to protect those young workers. That's the whole reason we're here talking about that. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. We're now going to recognize the chair of the full committee, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Spiro, let me follow through on that because uh, Mr. Biggs said that um, um, ESG funds as a whole don't do as well as index funds. Isn't it true that most other fund actively managed funds don't do as well as index funds either? Uh, that, that has been uh, true for many active funds, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think um, the arguments that get into returns on ESG. I mean, obviously we feel our study is the gold standard on this, but I, I think they tend to sort of cherry pick specific examples. When you look at the totality of funds that are incorporating ESG information uh, into their strategy, uh, they have performed uh, you know, as well or better than conventional funds in previous years. Um, that's what we find. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Biggs, you indicated that uh, because index funds don't do as well, because of ESG funds don't do as well as index funds, 
Um, shouldn't that argument also exclude virtually all managed funds? Because they don't do as well as index funds either. In my point of view, if you're looking out for the, the pure financial best interests of your participants, an index fund is probably the best choice. Um, just to touch back on the, the points Mr. Shapiro made, I, I, I'd be happy to provide you a, a variety of sites to references of studies looking at ESG funds. I have some on my written testimony. I believe that Morningstar's study looked at more recent returns, last five years or so. ESG well, funds are heavily weighted to tech, have done well. The Boston College study looked over the longer term, where I think short-term factors are less important. They found it well, well, Mr. Biggs, I think I think we make the, made the point that the index fund. I think you made the point that index funds are probably better uh, sure. overall, anyway. But on the question of whose money is it, why shouldn't an employee be able to choose from a list of options what they want to uh, invest in, and why uh, why, why would you? be excluded from considering, if that's your choice, with your money, investments in ESG funds, why should you be required to support carbon pollution, gambling, and, um, and smoking, if you well, don't I'll, want to, uh, and, sure. and, a willing, and a willing, knowing the risk, it may, not, may or may not make as much, but that's your choice and it's your money. Why shouldn't that be your choice? Yeah, I should be clear. I am much more open to an ESG or an ethical fund being introduced as an option in a 401k, where I would have real problems would be if an ESG fund became the default, because we know that you know most people are going to go with that. Um, so I, it, you know, again, I'm not on a risk. Well, I, I think for that's me, there's important. a distinction between the, the individual's choice versus what is effectively being chosen on his behalf. If you're in a defined benefit fund, I think ESG is really problematic. Thank you. Um, Ms. Handoff, on mental, mental health parity, we talked about um, uh, the penalty, the, I think, absence of penalty for violation. Um, who enforces the um, a violation right now? Well, There's a violation on uh, mental health parity on, on insurance policies. Um, basically, the Department of Labor has the authority to make them come into compliance, employers to come into compliance, but, but that's it and then to pay whatever the required benefits are. Um, I think if you look at private litigation, you're gonna find some real changes being made because participants have banded together to fix the problems with large insurers and, self and third party administrators. Well, that sounds like class action to me. What, what's the, um, what is the problem with um, banning class action in some of these um, policies? Well, the problem with it is one single person cannot afford to bring litigation um, that's as complex as ERISA is, and they just don't have the money. It's not worth it to them. So it's really important that they be able to band together and to get meaningful relief. Um, that's the only way you're going to get change. Should there be any relief to insurance companies in, in terms of mental health parity? Um, if, the, if there's a provider shortage, part of putting a package together is getting a provider network in some areas, frankly, aren't the providers. Well, I think the providers, there are providers, it's, the networks, I think, are problematic altogether. Um, but networks definitely should, there's no incentive for them to get any uh, a greater network coverage. Um, and. And therefore, I mean, in some areas, network if, if network could include everybody, but if everybody, if they're not enough providers, some counties don't have psychiatrists. That's a problem, and that's why I think the the telehealth issue is a good one. Um, it would definitely expand the ability, the availability of benefits to people that are in those areas. And uh, what's wrong with arbitration clauses? Arbitration clauses keep people out of court. They make it impossible. Um, you know, I, I often see it in the context of employee stock ownership plans where it doesn't really make any sense that you would have arbitration provisions and each person would go into court individually to sue for the exact same violation that occurs for everybody. Um, it just doesn't work. And it's definitely put in plans to keep them from participants from protecting their rights. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you as well, Mr. Scott. Uh, that's our last uh, question. 
uh, for members. So I want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. So by close of business on March 15th, uh, 2022, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The materials must be sub uh, materials submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion for the hearing record. Um, documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame. But please recognize that in the future, that link may no longer uh, be operational. Pursuant to House rules and regulation, items to the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to edinlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. Again, I want to thank our witnesses. You've all been terrific, um, really good exchange um, and for your participation today. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to these questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive these responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, witness questions for hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. And now uh, I'd like to thank um, all of my colleagues. I want to thank my ranking member. I'm looking forward to being there in the, in the meeting room with you as well, Mr. Allen. Uh, and I now recognize you for a closing statement. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I ask unanimous consent to end the statements in the record from the Association for Behavioral Health and Wellness, the ERISA Industry Committee, Fidelity Investments, and the Hispanic Leadership Fund and a letter from the Partnership for Employer-Sponsored Coverage. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to thank the witnesses for their testimony today, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, I am concerned with the timing of the hearing and my colleagues' intentions. Uh, the committee should focus on enacting bipartisan RISE Act, not jumping to consider a new, more partisan retirement package. It is my hope that the committee continues to its important tradition of bipartisan cooperation in retirement legislation. As we heard from today's testimony, the financial interests of retirement savers and beneficiaries must be prioritized. The Biden administration's proposed rule requiring ESG investing in private uh, retirement plans not only contradicts ERISA, but also threatens the savings of American workers and retirees. DOL's proposed rule and similar legislative proposals would place retirement savers third behind the political whims of the majority and a fiduciary fearing a lawsuit for noncompliance. Thank you again to all the witnesses for, for participating in today's hearing. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. Uh, first, I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from the American Federation of State County and municipal employees into the record uh, without objection, um, so ordered. Thanks again to the witnesses, uh, really mean it. It was a good conversation uh, and encouraging. In spite of our differences, I think there's a lot that we can work on together. Um, so thank you very much. Today we discussed, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of helping workers access secure retirement, high quality healthcare. Unfortunately, as our witnesses shared, many workers continue to face barriers to saving for retirement and receiving the care they need. That is why Congress and this committee advanced legislation to improve retirement security, strengthen health benefits, and protect pensions of more than 1 million workers and retirees through the American Rescue Plan. 
I look forward to continuing our efforts to advance common sense solutions that meaningfully improve the lives of American workers and retirees. I welcome my Republican colleagues support for these ideas and also welcome our conversation. Thank you again to our witnesses. If there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thanks.